in the previous lectures um, we have talked about generally about programming and, and motivation for why it's a good idea to learn functional programming. Uh, and now you might be wondering, yeah, yeah, cut the talk. When are we going to start learning F sharp? So um, I'm going to have to disappoint you a little bit because it will be a few more lectures before we get to, to actually doing F sharp. Uh, because first, I really want to go through some of the um, uh, theoretical foundations for doing function, functional programming so that we set the, set the stage and, and we get the language and the, the concepts um, that we need. And then we can look at the programming afterwards. Because I know all of you know how to program already, so this is really to show the main ideas and differences between uh, what we could call normal programming. Um, so in the upcoming few lectures we will be talking about functions uh, and rather from a, a mathematical perspective we're going to look at uh, and, and sort of in a way derive the properties of functions that we're going to need to do functional programming. Um, and we're going to see a little bit on how incredibly powerful um, entities functions are as a means of abstraction. Um, and we're also going to delve a little bit into types uh, and talk about types, which are actually quite closely related to functions as well. Um, since F sharp is a strongly typed uh, functional language, uh, we're going to need to know about a bit about it. Um, it's quite possible to find languages, uh, to functional languages, where, uh, which allow you to do functional programming without types, and that's perfectly valid. Most, uh, for example, Lisp, Lisps are functional, but they don't have types, or they have types sort of attached to them, uh, and and that's perfectly fine. Um, but at the same time, once you know about types, they are an absolutely invaluable tool for. Uh, writing robust uh, software and they help you to think about problems and that's where the biggest value is really in abstracting the world. Um, I'm talking I'm, I'm using the word abstract and abstraction all the time uh, and I think it might be in place to to say what I actually mean. So abstraction is the opposite of concrete it's the essence of a problem, really the bare bone essence of something, where all the particularities of some particular form of the problem has been uh, been removed. So, uh, so, like a little trivial example of this is like I can draw a ice cream cone here with a nice little waffle. So here we have an ice cream. Um, uh, if you're driving alongside along the road, you might have you seen these uh, roadside cones to prevent you from driving into potholes. And these are both examples of a shape which we commonly refer to as cones. Now, of course, um, we can sort of say, okay, the, the, the similarity, there's a, there's a pattern going on here. So we can abstract that into a shape, which we can then say, well, it has a a circular base and a radius and it has a particular height here uh, and now we have already said a little bit more about the shape than, than we have but uh, we can also go one step further and using the language of mathematics we can say pi r oh, squared h divided by 3 and this is really sort of the ultimate abstraction that we have the vol it gives us the volume of the cone and basically fully determines the shape of it through this formula. And there is no reference to any, anything else in this. Now we have distilled down the bare bone essence and, and properties of the cone essentially into this, um, into this form. So we have gone from an ice cream to something which has nothing to do with ice cream anymore. So that's just one example. And in a way we can say that mathematics is 
really the language of uh, abstraction. Mathematics is seeing patterns and putting them into to this very, very abstract form, which distills out the essence of that pattern. When we talk about patterns, uh, and we will be talking a lot about these abstractions and patterns in functional programming, um, it's very important to, to remember that the patterns that we usually want to talk about are emergent patterns, inherent patterns in the problems that we are studying. This is quite different from, from um, design patterns, which any of you might know, uh, popularized in object-oriented programming, for example, by the Gang of Four book, um, where these patterns, again, are not emergent, but sort of tacked on in a way. Like these are patterns that you, that are conventions how to solve particular problems. It's not totally unrelated, but there's a, a subtle difference. So a typical uh, design pattern could be the factory pattern or the delegate pattern or the, uh, or the um, um, singleton pattern or the visitor pattern and all of these. These are sort of the design patterns. But we're rather interested in looking at the problem and seeing repetitive structures and distilling out the essence of that repetition into some form that we can, can then use. And we will see many, many, many examples of this throughout the course. Right, so that was a little bit about just abstraction and the importance of abstraction. And this is going to be a key, uh, a key topic throughout the whole course, how we abstract. Um, so, functional programming. What's the fuss with it? What's really, if we're going to compare it to normal programming? Functional programming is absolutely normal, ordinary programming, with a little twist. And that is that we are using pure functions as our primary means of abstraction. This will get clearer, clearer later. Now, a, a pure function is a function which takes an input, A, and produces some output, B. It might take some, yeah, yeah, without saying what these are. It's, and it's black box. This is all it does. It takes an A and it produces a B. Um, and inside of this, it's a black box. There is no communication uh, with the outside world inside this box. There's no information coming in from, from, from outside. Which means in terms of a computer program, it means it can't read global variables. It can't, um, it can't read the network, it can't read the disk. It can't modify the outside world. All it can do is it can get a number or get some data in and produce some data out. And this makes functions incredibly boring. Because if I take a function, suppose this is the square function, it takes an integer here and it produces another integer on this side. And I give it five it will produce 25 and it will do so for eternity and I can give it five a billion times and it will always produce the same answer and this makes the function super boring. This is very different from a procedure or a subroutine or a method or whatever you want to call it which actually can read global variables and can read disk and can do things over the network. If, if I would do this with a procedure and it would, would be able to, to actually fetch some auxiliary data from somewhere, I might be getting 25, 25, 25, 28, minus 5, 25, 25, and I can't really know. So we can't never, never trust a procedure like fully, but the function we can. And this is really good because it gives us stability. Boring is good. And it's also very nice for testing because we can test our function once and for all. And once it's tested, as long as nobody touches the code, 
We don't have to test it again. It will work. And not only will it work in the context where we created the function, we can take that function and we can move it to some other code. We can reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. And that is not true in general for procedures. They are highly dependent on their environment, the context where they are. We cannot just simply take an, uh, a class and pull out the method and plug it into some other class and hope that it works because it's dependent on certain class uh, variables being available, certain maybe global variables being available, maybe files available and so on. We can't just reuse it, but functions we can. And that's a great, a great thing with functions. Um, this does not mean that we can't live, uh, that we should just use functions and nothing else. We are certainly dependent, regardless of what type of program we do, we are dependent on having procedures as well. Because if we would make a program from just and only pure functions, the only thing you could produce from that program would be heat. There's no way of, of uh, reading and writing, so we can't give it input and we can't get any output out of it. The only thing we can generate with it running that program is heat. So we need to have both. But in functional programming, we try to prefer to have pure functions and the majority of the code in pure functions. And this will affect how we structure, structure our programs. Um, Another feature of functional programming that we are going to use extensively in this course is composition. Function composition and data composition. Uh, and this allows us to take some very, very simple small components and stick them together in spe specified ways. And then that way we can produce something which has higher complexity and we can be sure that it works. Then we can take that piece and stick it together with something again and again and again, and we can build these complex behaviors from very, very simple components. So for anyone who is familiar with the, with the Unix, this should be a very familiar thing. Um, and I think one of the Probably the reasons why the Unix operating system has been uh, so successful and for so many years has to do with the fact that it has been designed in a very functional manner. If we think about what has happened with computers uh, over the past 50 years soon, when Unix was conceived, the operating, the essentials of the operating system haven't changed. But if you think about what has happened with the computer since 1970 to 2020, it's a staggering development. And these days, Unix is running on the largest, largest computers on, in the world, with hundreds and thousands of cores, even millions of cores, down to the tiniest, tiniest little machines and watches and dishwashers and toasters and aquariums and what have you not. It's all over the place. It scales to the biggest and to the smallest. And one of the reasons is that if we look at the, the design philosophy by, in Unix is that basically everything is a file. Everything is data and that's just data. And I'll talk a little bit more about data soon. And then the, the, one of the principles is that all the commands should do one thing and do it well. And commands, they will usually take input from, from the standard in and produce output on standard output. Which is essentially to say that it's, it's a function that will um, get some input and produce some output. Which we can then couple to uh, compose with other functions in order to build more powerful and, and speci specialized commands. So, uh, for example, we could do something like cat hello.txt, read a file, that's IO, but it will just read some data from a file, and then we can pipe it. 
This is the composition. And then we might translate any capital H to a lower case, a case H. We might pipe that into sort. And then we might pipe that into unique. And we might pipe that into some further commands. And this way we are building a powerful complex command to, to do some processing on on the uh, on the data in this file by using some very simple small components which does one thing and one thing only and the data flows until it reaches the screen and we might pipe it into a file or put it in a file most of you have probably also done function composition in in normal programming so we could do something like uh, calling the sign function on the exponential of some x. And we might want to print that. Or we could say that, well, uh, so we could just say that f of x equals this. In school mathematics, you can write this as, we could say, well, we could say call this h instead. We could, say, we, could, we could just say that uh, this is sine exp, sorry, exp sine, exp sine function composition, where this would be read first, uh, first we do the exp, then we do the sine, produce this which is again this is like working a little bit like the piping operator um, it turns out that that composition is so important in in uh, both in programming and in, in mathematics that there's a really intriguing and grand mathematical theory of composition which is called Category theory. And we won't uh, talk much about category theory in, in this lecture series. We will mention it a couple of times and pull out some, uh, some interesting little uh, results just for, for fun. But category theory uh, is the theory of composition. And once you deep, dive deep into it, it will come up with some quite amazing uh, results that we can use in order to pull out patterns from our codes and um, use that for, for abstracting in very powerful ways. So this is a hot topic and it's still, still much uh, an active topic in, in mathematics. And if you go and look on the web, you can find plenty of really good tutorials on category theory. But be warned, uh, this is very abstract. Even the mathematicians tend to think that the category theory is overly abstract. So, so this is really flexing your abstraction, abstraction muscles. Before we conclude, let's talk a little bit more about composition. So we'll look briefly now at function composition. But there's a, another aspect of composition, which is data composition. And and um, if we look at pure data, pure data composes nicely, really. It doesn't really have, data doesn't have implementation. Data has representation. So we can represent data in, in some form and, and it's, it's really quite simple to, to compose data. So if we, if we would do something simple, I'm just gonna do a list. So we do a list of one, two, three. A list of three, um, three numbers, and then I'll, I'm just going to invent a plus operator. Uh, so then I can do another list, which would be 99100. And the question is, how would I compose these two lists? And there are many ways to do this. Obviously, I could create a list 
of two lists, one with one, two, three, and the other one with the 99 and 100. That's, that's certainly a valid, uh, valid way of, of composing them. Um, but there is a natural way of composing lists, which is the one that we just say, well, the sum of two lists would be 1, 2, 3, 9, 9, 100. And similarly, if we have, if we have dictionaries. So if we, have, uh, if we have two dictionaries with keys and values, then the sum of two dictionaries would simply be merging those two, uh, merging those two um, dictionaries. Now, of course, in a dictionary, we have a unique key, a requirement that the key is unique, it can't be duplicated. So then we need to come up with, with some rule for what happens if we duplicate the key. Which one should be? Should we keep the original one or should we take the other one? Should we do a left join or a right join? Or some other scheme. But the fact is, data composes. And pretty much any data can be put into to either it's a list of stuff or it's a dictionary of things. We can put it in there. Now, if we go to object-oriented programming, which is so popular these days, what is the, what is the composition of two objects? It's a good question. We need to define it. We need to implement it ourselves every time. So once we've composed two objects into a new object, uh, we want to compose that a third time. We're going to have to compose it again, uh, write the, rewrite the code or implement the composition again and again and again. Objects do not compose naturally. There's, there's no way of composing them because they have a lot of meaning to them in the methods, the data they expect, and so on. And we don't really know anything about the internal structure of those objects. Whereas basic data composers, just think about JSON files. What is the composition of two JSON files? It's a JSON file. It's just the same story all over. Of course, we need to uh, have some rules for how to, to, to compose, but those are very general. And once we have them, we know what the rules are, and then it's trivial to compose any, any set of JSON files, any dictionaries, any lists of objects, regardless of what they contain. Because they are operating on the structure rather than on the details of the internals. It doesn't matter if we compose integer lists or lists with strings or mixed lists or so. And while we are at the topic, uh, a word that I'm going to use quite often in this course uh, is also something, a mathematical term, which is very important, which is, the, is isomorphism. ISO means equal or same, and this is form, something of the same form. We're gonna, in the next lecture, we're going to talk more about isomorphism to, uh, towards the end and sort of a little bit more formal definition of this. But what this means is two things which are isomorphic can be turned into one or the other completely without loss of information. And this is important. We can transform one thing into the other without losing any information and, or, and adding any information, because if we added anything, we couldn't transform it back. And uh, as an example of an isomorphism, we're gonna, we can take this example. Take a list of one, two, three. I can write it like this, but I could also write this um, as a set of tuples. So I could say 
two comma two, and I could say uh, one comma one. Uh, for example, let's do something else. Let's do one five three, right? So then I can say two comma five. 1, 1, and 3, 3, in this form. These two can be converted back and forth between each other completely generally without any loss. This states that the second element in the list should be a 5, the first element should be a 1, and the third element should be a 3. They are different representations. This looks like it contains more information but that information is implicitly in this, uh, in the order of elements. These two are isomorphic. And this is something that we're going to be looking at quite a lot when, when dealing with, with abstractions and, and uh, uh, representations of things. Because sometimes one is more convenient than the other. So I think that concludes this lecture. And um, next lecture we will be looking at functions in uh, a lot more detail.